We know that uh, Social Security is one of the uh, most effective anti-poverty uh, programs in the United uh, States. Uh, and one of the most uh, effective retirement programs I think our government has ever done. However, it was designed to be part of a, uh, they say, the three-legged stool. And sadly, uh, those other two legs of the stool, savings and private retirement accounts, uh, have begun to fail in increasing rates. And with us now is Jessica Bruder. Uh, she uh, teaches at the Columbia Journalism School. She's a journalist herself and has written The End of Retirement When You Can't Afford to Stop Working in the August edition of Harper's Magazine. Jessica, welcome to the program. Oh, Jessica, are you there? I am. Okay. Can great. you hear me? Yes. Uh, right. So uh, the, the piece is uh, really heartbreaking. You... Um, you went out um, uh, across the country to follow and find folks who um, uh, ha are, are basically um, working through their retirement or just uh, barely surviving. Let's let's start with with Linda May. Tell us about Linda May. Sure, Linda's amazing. Linda's sixty four. Uh, a few years ago, she realized that when she was eligible for Social Security, it was only going to be about $499 a month. We're not in an era of secure retirement finance. Uh, Linda never accrued a pension, something that used to be pretty common and is now much less so as uh, defined benefit pensions give way to 401ks and other stuff. But although she'd worked all her life, Linda really had nothing to fall back on. She was working at Home Depot as a cashier, making ten fifty an hour, and pretty much realized that was her life until the day she died, unless she made a change. She was living in a trailer. She was pretty miserable. She decided to change things up by saving up for an RV. She got one pretty cheap. It had just been driven into a telephone pole, so it had this big crater on the front. But Linda's done construction. She knows how to fix stuff like that. So she basically struck out on the road, like a lot of the people I met, and she went to work for something called Camper Force. This now, is the Amazon before we Camper get to Force. that, just tell us, I mean, um, mm -hmm. uh, what, what, just give us a sense of what her employment history had been. Oh, she'd done all sorts of stuff. She'd been a building inspector, a general contractor. She'd been a cocktail waitress. She'd owned a flooring store. She'd been an insurance executive. She's kind of a Jill of all trades and very, very resilient. And and, so, the, um, and this idea to um, uh, to strike out on the the camper came from a guy named Bob Wells. Tell us a little bit about Bob Wells. Bob is amazing. Bob used to work in a Safeway up in Alaska. He was a union clerk making a reasonable wage, but when he got divorced, he'd been the sole source of income for his family and basically couldn't support a split family, though he'd been able to comfortably support an intact one. So he ended up moving into a box van and living in the parking lot of the Safeway while he continued to work. Now, the interesting thing is he was at first pretty freaked out. You know, am I going to be a social pariah? What does this mean? I'm living in a van. And then basically got into it and has since become a guru for the van dwelling set. He started a website called CheapRVLiving.com that Linda May came across and helped inspire her change. But basically, some of the people Bob knew were making it on $500 a month or less by traveling, living in a van, paring down their expenses, and um, just being out on the road permanently. So that's where Linda got her idea. And so you followed uh, Linda to, to Fernley, Nevada. What, what was in Fernley, Nevada? I initially went to Fernley because I'd heard about Camper Force. That's Amazon has a warehouse in Fernley, which is about a half an hour from Reno. And it's a gigantic distribution hub. It's so big that they call half of it Utah and half of it Nevada because it's, it's just massive. And when the holidays come, they need extra labor. Uh, it's their peak, their peak shipping season starts in the fall and runs right up till Christmas. And one of the ways they've started getting extra people in, this started in 2008. Um, timing, I don't think, is a coincidence with the recession. But they basically started hiring RVers, so itinerant workers. Most of them live on the road full time. And a lot of them, as I saw when I went to visit the RV parks where they live, are of what in another era would have been considered retirement age or close to it. And so, do, I mean, do did you get a sense? I mean, is there any way really to get a sense of, of just 
how many people, I mean, if you've already got sort of like these institutions that are now being set up for this demographic, I mean, and, and, and I think at one point you, 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 you mentioned that it, it's somewhat reminiscent of Grapes of Wrath in a way, where you've got these uh, migrating workers, except for in this instance, they're all, they're, they're seniors. And, and one of the things that's fascinating about your story is it almost, it goes from, sort of grapes of wrath into sort of almost easy rider in some, in some, yeah. in some fashion. Um, but yeah, I call it nickel, nickel and dimes meets on the road. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I mean, do we have a sense of how many, um, how many people, uh, make up, uh, or, or in similar situations? It's really hard to tell exactly because I mean, counting nomads is, is, a challenge. They don't all go to one place. They don't all have to sign up with, you know, there's no national nomad registry. But one thing that I look at is the growth of these individual programs. So for example, Amazon's program started in 2008 with just a, a handful of these people. And now, according to what a recruiter told me at one of their, uh, they, they go to Quartzsite, Arizona to do some recruiting. Uh, I was told that the headcount is now up to 2000. Uh, the sugar beet harvest, which also hires people in this situation, they were seeking to hire 600 people for this year's harvest, up from 450 the year before. So the fact that we see these programs growing, I believe, suggests the same for the overall population. Um, again, it's hard to say because that's demand and who knows exactly what the supply of labor is, but it's certainly convenient for employers. I mean, you've got a plug-and-play workforce. People show up with their homes. Uh, they're, not allow- or along- they're not around long enough to organize. And when the jobs are gone, they're gone too. So, in a in a way, it's a large company's dream in terms of flexible labor. So give to us have this available. So give us a notion of what of, of what a sort of living, uh, I guess, as as part of the camper force is like. Sure. So a lot of these people show up in the early fall. Uh, some of them even late August, I believe now, and uh, a few different warehouses around the country. Basically, when you're near one of these warehouses, all the RV parks and trailer parks uh, that are remotely nearby will be full. In Fernley, I visited an RV park called the Desert Rose, and I believe some of the spaces there had been booked for maybe a year out. People were just planning and ready to go. So you've got these trailer parks that become ephemeral company towns. They're full of RVs. They're full of – they get these tiny economies where people who aren't working in the warehouses will – uh, be working by walking dogs or cooking meals or helping people fix their RVs. So you get this micro economy. And meanwhile, most of the people are working in the warehouse. There are day shifts, there are night shifts. Some of the jobs involve walking as much as 15 miles on concrete floors during the day. I did meet a bunch of people who'd gotten injuries. Linda May was still wearing a brace on her wrist from using the UPC scanner some six months um, no, six weeks, I apologize, after she'd been there. Um, I met people who'd gotten trigger finger injuries, stuff like that, like a lot of repetitive motion tasks. And um, and they get treated. There's a there's literally a, a, a company infirmary that I guess is now, I mean, I wonder like how much of that infirmary is geared towards, uh, you know, more oriented towards geriatric care. Um, it's hard to say because I know they have tons and tons of temps and just the regular staff, too. I think it's probably in there for liability reasons, to be honest. I think it's not uh, it's not necessarily all geriatric, but certainly uh, Linda had to use it once. In fact, she was feeling super faint on the job, had to go there. They put her in an ambulance and actually took her out to a hospital in Reno. Uh, couldn't figure out quite what was wrong with her, but seemed related to the work because she kept getting dizzy. So it seems that it's there to catch whoever is having trouble with the labor, but I don't know that I'd say it's old age specific. And um, uh, you talk about how there are, uh, I guess, uh, websites, Worker on Wheels, Work Camper News, where people get classified. Where do people end up um, w- working? I mean, it's not just these uh, Amazon and these uh, and the uh, the Crystal Sugar uh, Company. Yeah, they go all over the place. So apart from Amazon and the the sugar beet harvest, which are two pretty big employers, uh, you'll see ads 
they're trying to get people to sell Christmas trees. You know, you know those roadside stands where it's come get the Christmas tree, strap it to the roof of the station wagon. The people who are manning those stands will sometimes be work campers selling Halloween pumpkins, Fourth of July fireworks. Work campers pick raspberries, blueberries. They get hired to guard gates at Texas oil fields. That's a big one, gate guarding. Um, because basically they log all of the truck traffic coming in and off the oil field. So that's a 24-hour job that uh, often they hire couples to do that, and the couple will live in an RV right at the gate and be logging people all the time. One of the other huge jobs would be camp hosting. So you've got private concessionaires and the U.S. Forest Service and the Army Corps of Engineers, and they hire uh, work campers to maintain hundreds of campgrounds all across the country and up into Canada. And um, some of the folks that um, you came across, I guess it was in, in Fernley uh, and in Las Vegas, are uh, part of that lawsuit that um, uh, we're in um, dealing with Amazon's security measures. Just tell us a little bit about that. And I wonder if, if this is an indication that there's at least some impetus to perhaps organize in some fashion. Well, that's interesting. I talked to Mark Dearman, who's, uh, um, I might be butchering his last name. It looks like Stearman. Apologies, Mark. But he's the labor attorney who's handling the case that you're speaking about. And basically, there is a lawsuit right now. You've got Amazon employees who are arguing they're owed back wages because they spend often as much as 25 minutes in line waiting to leave the plant at the end of a shift because Amazon puts them through a pretty rigorous security process to make sure that they haven't, you know, shoplifted anything, essentially. But, you know, that's not considered on the clock time, even though it eats out of the day, um, and they're suing for back wages. To the best of my knowledge, none of the itinerant workers uh, are involved in the suit, which doesn't surprise me. Again, they are hard to organize. They're on the road. They're mobile. Um, it's not a group that's unified in quite the same way as somebody who's in a fixed spot doing a job for more than a couple months at a time. And when I talked to the attorney, uh, work campers hadn't even been on his radar. Uh, I mentioned that population to him, and he said that it didn't surprise him that everybody in that plant is pretty much a mouse on a treadmill, um, but that he hadn't come across any yet in, in his organizing uh, of the workers for the lawsuit. And um, and so you uh, you follow um, uh, May and I guess some of these other folks to uh, court Quartzsite, Arizona. Uh, tell us about Quartzsite. Quartzsite is a wild place. Um, the funny thing was, I kept hearing about it. It reminded me of, you know, if you go to a, a Passover seder, you'll hear next year in Jerusalem. It was always this winter in Quartzsite. This winter in Quartzsite. Everyone's going to Quartzsite. I heard this everywhere I went in Fernley when I'm interviewing, um, you know, when I was interviewing people in the RVs and I kept saying, what's Quartzsite? And nobody was really explaining it that well. One guy told me it was Burning Man for geezers. Uh, and I figured if all the people that I was interested in, you know, if they were all going there, I probably should just go figure it out myself. So I got a tent and went and lived in the desert in Quartzsite for about three weeks last January. Uh, Quartzsite is a town in the Sonoran Desert in Arizona. It has been popular with snowbirds and retirees for a long time just because of the temperature. Uh, and as the economy's fallen out, it's also gotten popular with people of retirement age who can camp there for free. So basically, while there are RV parks in town, what a lot of people do is they boondock. Uh, boondocking is dry camping. It means you don't have any utility hookups. Some people use generators or solar panels. And they can do that for free in a bunch of areas around the town that are uh, designated federal desert land. So it's become a magnet. There, um, in January each year, the jobs are getting pretty scarce. The Amazon jobs are over. A lot of the campsites aren't full because it's cold in most of the country. So it, a lot of these people who are doing temporary jobs are essentially furloughed. So many of them gather in Quartzsite, and that's where I went to catch up with them. And so let's let's talk a little bit about, I mean, before we, uh, we sort of return to, I guess, like, you know, what what is the future for these folks? Let's let's just uh, uh, more broadly uh, 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 speak about the notion of retirement. I mean, I um, you, you I mean, what what do I guess I'm, I'm curious as to like what how much of the perspective that these folks have? Do they perceive this as? A, um, a, a a problem that is sort of larger than their own personal decisions. 
you know, I've spoken to people who have gone across the country and talked to people uh, whose whose homes in the following of the financial crisis were in foreclosure and uh, they have uh, uh, dipped into uh, poverty, in and out of poverty uh, from what was a stable middle class life. And, and I'm curious mm-hmm. as to how, how these people see themselves. Um, is it is it. Is it that they are in this situation because of personal uh, uh, decisions or or do they see this as something more systemically wrong? I think it's really a mix. I mean, people are quite unique the way they interpret their circumstances. I mean, uh, you know, I talked to people who told me some pretty rough financial tales and then would tell me, you know, I'm doing this by choice. This is freedom. A lot of people, I think, seek agency in difficult circumstances. Then you've got people who really did contextualize it. I met a gentleman named David Roderick, who was 77 years old and working at Amazon and had been a State Department fellow doing overseas education stuff for years. And he was reading, uh, you know, books about the death of retirement and Social Security and really had a sense of how people like him might be part of a broader economic wave. I talked to one guy who had lost his home uh, in basically the housing collapse and said that when he got to Amazon, he felt like suddenly he was in the matrix, that he'd see, he saw the reality, basically that he'd woken up to what the economy meant while so many others were still sleeping. So you do have people like that. And you also have people who just say, this is my life. I'm, I'm thinking about it on the day to day and doing the best I can. And, um, and, you know, who don't really contextualize it. And, and, and what of these folks' uh, families? I mean, are they... Uh, I mean, what what is their perspective um, to the extent that they have uh, children who are out with uh, with their own families? I mean, what is what is their perspective on, uh, uh, in, in that regard? One thing that was really interesting, I was interviewing a pastor who runs a soup kitchen in Quartzsite, Pastor Mike. And when I asked him, you know, what is Quartzsite? The first thing he said was, it's a cheap place to hide. And I was thinking to myself, well, these people aren't on the lam. What do you mean? You know, they're not, uh, they're not bandits hiding from people. And he was talking about people hiding from their families. He said in some cases he saw situations where families and, you know, adult children didn't realize how rough things were getting for their parents who were trying to put a happy face on it and showed up in courtside and were kind of shocked by the situation. Um, he... A lot of people, I just don't think, you know, it's not like their kids are having an easy time of it. A lot of people are very proud, don't want to fall back on their kids. Some people have lived on and off with their kids, but found that, you know, they were couch surfing or there wasn't enough room. And basically this was kind of a bit at independence and freedom, uh, even if it meant not having a permanent home, just getting out on the road. And, and, and so what I mean, what, what what do people do in the future? I mean, you touch on this in your piece. I mean, this is I mean, you're talking uh, mostly to people in their uh, late 50s, their 60s, uh, their mm-hmm. 70s. Uh, what happens after that? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little scared to know the answer in some cases. I mean, I'm sure some back in the days before Social Security, uh, pre-New Deal era, you had two choices when you got old, unless you happened to be fabulously wealthy, which was quite rare. Uh, you would either fall back on your family or you would go to the poorhouse. And the poorhouse was pretty much a Dickensian nightmare. Now, the poorhouse doesn't exist anymore. I do still think a lot of people fall back on family. They try to stay independent for as long as they can. But when they're unable to work, uh, things get a little more difficult. They might be mobility impaired. Um, they will fall back on family, even if uh, it's something they would have tried to delay for as long as possible. There's actually an RV community in Texas where they provide uh, medical care for older people who've had to get off the road. That's pretty small, though. That's not not a trend that I've seen growing. Um, And then there's some really scary stories. When I was out on the road, I talked to a couple people who knew of folks who, who passed away in their RVs. There was one guy who was found in a Walmart park, more parking lot, another who was found on the gravel terraces of Ehrenberg, not far from Quartzsite in his RV. He'd been staying at the soup kitchen in Quartzsite for a while and had just gone out there by himself. Um, so it's a little scary. I think the future is uncertain, um, and it, it's, it'll be interesting to see how people, you know, these are very creative, resilient people, um, but it's still not going to be an easy situation. 
Did you get a sense in the course of uh, of writing this story? I mean, you know, you you are writing about people who are incredibly creative and uh, resilient, and but I imagine that they are sort of outliers. I mean, that to the extent you know, w- when we look at the data and we see that this generation uh, and, and who are headed into what we used to call retirement, I guess. Uh, at least in the you know the the past seventy years, um, are in worse shape than their parents in some respects heading into mm-hmm. retirement. I mean, do we have a sense of like what everyone else is doing? I mean, the, you know, we're talking about a, a small subset uh, of people who have figured it out to a certain extent what they're going to do. Uh, you know, by by necessity. But what what of the rest? Sure. I mean, I don't I don't even think of these people as quite that secure. I mean, it's interesting. When I took I talked to Monique Morrissey at the Economic Policy Institute, she was telling me this is the first ever reversal in retirement security in modern American history, which means exactly what you're saying that you know each generation is becoming more precarious than the last instead of more stable. Uh, that means some pretty scary stuff. Another economist I talked to, Teresa Gilarducci at the New School, said that you know about half of middle class Americans when they retire are going to have a food budget as a, uh, of as like as little as five dollars a day. So it's pretty scary. I mean, what people are doing is you know, imagine if Linda May hadn't struck out on the road, she'd probably still be working at Home Depot for as long as she could, living in this six hundred dollar a month trailer, uh, feeling isolated, and she would probably keep on doing that until she could no longer do it and, and it's you not know, a pretty it, picture it, it's not a pretty picture and i wonder what it's going to take i mean because you know here you have uh a a, a group of people who are you know uh i don't want to say uniquely but are particularly sort of um uh self-motivated and uh brave frankly i mean this is mm-hmm. you have no idea what you're doing when you you say i'm going to save what little money I have and bet it on, you know, a camper essentially mm-hmm. lasting uh, for the next 15, 20 some odd years or something. Um, mm-hmm. it, the, I, I'm just struck by w- w- the, the dynamic of, of, of organizing and where they see themselves uh, politically because, you know, we know that these people are hanging on barely, and and some of them aren't even, I guess, uh, uh, by the the meager payments they get with Social Security. Yet, the to the extent that we talk, we hear Social Security talked about, uh, it is as often, if not more often, talking about cutting the cost of living increases as anything else. I, I wonder how this changes. I mean, I wonder is there a point where there is some type of organizing to sort of say, like, or is it that the struggle for survival at this age becomes so paramount that political organizing sort of is, is a luxury that they just don't have? That's pretty much what I was seeing. I mean, when you're working an overnight shift on concrete, your whole body hurts. These RVs I, I visited were tricked out like mini apothecaries. You see a bottle of ibuprofen. I talked to one woman who was taking you know, for, forgive me, I forget if it's ibuprofen or aspirin, but four in the morning and then four after work. And, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty day-to-day thing. I think it's harder to think about the meta picture. It's hard to think about where is the country going. It's more about how am I going to, you know, fill my fridge this week so I can keep going. Well, it's an incredibly important piece. It's in Hopper, Harper's Magazine, uh, the August issue. Uh, I think you can. Um, I, I think there's a firewall online, but you can. Um, you, folks should sign up and get Harper's anyway. If if you haven't uh, subscribed to the um, to the uh, the print version, and it's it's really a, a piece that's particularly important for those of us who aren't uh, in retirement yet. While we still have the sort of, I guess the the luxury of organizing uh, politically, uh, because this is a this seems to be just a major crisis that uh, of retirement that doesn't that society just has not seemingly woken up to. Yeah, no, it's a huge issue. It's a huge issue and one that for a long time people have been pretty silent on. So Jessica Bruder, I'm glad to see that's starting to change. 
Jessica Bruder uh, from Harper's, uh, thank you so much uh, for your time today. Thanks for having me.